Stacy. I'm Kathleen Stevens, and welcome to the latest in the KEI Conversation Series. I am delighted to be joined today by my old friend Dan Snyder, who's joining us from Palo Alto, California, to talk about an issue that's uh, been with us for a while, but very much in the news right now, uh, relations between South Korea and Japan, and why that matters to the U.S. Uh, Dan Snyder is lecturer in East Asian Studies at Stanford University. He was correspondent for the Christian Science Monitor for many years, uh, reporting out of Tokyo and Seoul. Uh, continues to write, and I'm sure we have many people joining us today who've read some of his columns on a variety of issues related to U.S. policy in East Asia, including the relationship between South Korea and Toyo Kazai and other well-known publications. Uh, this is going to be a very informal conversation. I'm going to have, get Dan to tell us his latest thoughts on what's going on, and we're going to try to leave some time in about 20 minutes for some questions. For those of you on Zoom, please submit them through the Q&A function. Uh, well, Dan, I mean, just to kind of catch us where we are today, President Biden, of course, uh, had to, has had two face-to-face -face, uh, summit meetings so far, and they happen to be first with Prime Minister Suga of Japan and then with, with President Moon of, of South Korea. That in itself, I guess, indicates how important the relationship, the bilateral relationship the U.S. has with each country is, is the United States, and of course, how important their ability to work together is. But I want you to talk a little bit more about that. But we're in this situation where, as far as I know, these two leaders have never actually met each other, certainly not formally. And in fact, I don't think there have been meeting, meetings between leaders of, of South Korea and Japan uh, at a serious level for quite some time. Uh, but next week, with uh, all three leaders heading to Europe for the G7, there's now talk that there might be a trilateral meeting or maybe even a bilateral meeting. Uh, so with all that and a court case, yet another court case in South Korea, uh, just announced yesterday where the court, uh, in contradiction to earlier cases, dismissed a war wartime compensation suit against Japanese companies in what some are calling a potential step towards thawing ties with Tokyo. This is the first time, to, first perfect time to have you here, Dan. So welcome. Uh, set the stage. Uh, you've written that the Biden administration has been preaching, I like that word, preaching the importance of trilateral cooperation to South Korea and Japan. Of course, it was mentioned in both the lengthy joint statements that came out from the two summits. But you've also written that the Biden administration is frustrated with just how difficult it's turning out to be. So could you just maybe say a few words about why does this matter so much to the Biden administration? It didn't seem to matter too much to the Trump administration. And, and why is it so difficult? Well, first of all, I want to thank Ambassador Stevens and uh, KEI for, for, for inviting me to, to have this conversation. And it's much easier to do it with somebody that I've known for a long time and who was my I'm also my former colleague at Stanford, uh, and we talk together uh, and still do every once in a while. So uh, we, we've been having this conversation between us for a while. So now we'll have it for the little wider audience. I think the for the Biden administration, the fact that they had Prime Minister Suga and President Moon as the first two foreign leaders into the Oval Office, this is you know sort of beyond symbolism. I mean, it obviously was meant to send a message. Uh, but when you think back to previous administrations, I think it was always the tradition that the, the British prime minister or the Canadian prime minister were the first ones through the door. So, and, and add to that, that Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin, their first foreign trip was to Japan and to Korea. So there's a lot of messaging going on there. And it's not hard to figure out what, what the message is, because they've said that Strategic competition with China is the central focus of the foreign policy of the Biden administration. They've said that allies and alliances are the fundamental basis of American foreign policy and that one of their goals sort of in this idea that, you know, bringing America back, sort of find, finding a way to compensate for the damage done to the credibility of American leadership by the four years of the Trump administration, uh, it, the most important goal is to, you know, revive the centrality of alliances. So those two things alone put, in some sense, our two Northeast Asian allies uh, at the center of their policy. But I think also that, uh, and, and there's no question that you can't really construct a response to China's rise without Japan and Korea. Uh, and these are where the American presence in some sense in the Western Pacific and East Asia it, are anchored. Trilateral cooperation, however, has been always a goal of American policy, going back to the days of the Korean War, really, uh, 
Uh, and, you know, we have a pretty patchy record of being able to actually accomplish that because we have to try and overcome the tensions and the difficulties in the bilateral relationship between Japan and Korea. Sometimes we've been more successful than others. And some people would argue that our attempts to intervene, and that could go back to, for example, the normalization treaty between Japan and the Republic of Korea in 1965, which the US certainly was a behind the scenes actor in, sometimes has negative effects as well. We make progress, but we also create the impression that we uh, force people to do things that they may not have wanted to do otherwise. So I think the Biden, it, you know, with the, the, the dysfunctional nature of the Japan-Korea relationship in the last three years, and it's, I think, in some ways, worse than I can remember it over a long period of time, uh, is a huge strategic hole, if you will, in the Biden administration's approach to the region. If Japan, if the leaders of Japan and Korea can't even talk to each other in a serious way, and that's been true. I, I, I was trying to remember, I think the last time there was really a bilateral meeting, not one that took place on the sidelines of a, another meeting, may have been the fall of 2015. So that when that is the case, it's hard to talk about implementing a broad approach to China, cooperating on issues of how to deal with high technology issues, security of the uh, economic security issues, not to mention vaccine uh, deployment or all the climate change, all the areas of cooperation that the Biden administration has laid out as being essential to their policy. How do you do that if your two main allies can't talk to each other? So that's their problem. And uh, they're looking for every opportunity to get the three together. They've done it at the national security advisor level. They've done it, you know, they've tried to do it uh, with foreign ministers. They're trying to do it, they've done it on a military level. They're looking for all sorts of times to pull everybody together with this idea, let's focus on our shared and common uh, uh, interests and in some sense problems. Um, but so far it's incremental progress. And I think the frustrations that I hear anyway, are that, you know, that they both the Korean government and the Japanese government for their own reasons, in some ways, both rooted in domestic politics, mm. at the head are just not either eager or able to make a breakthrough here. And that's an that's a problem for them. Yeah, I, I want to get back to domestic politics uh, a little bit later that you mentioned. But, um, you know, I agree with you. The dis dysfunction, as you called it, over the last three years seems uh, kind of worse than ever. And I mean, somebody would point to the, 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 the breakdown of the, uh, the Comfort Woman Agreement, uh, the court cases and so on. But, you know, is there something deeper there? Is it because is it because of this greater strategic rivalry between the U.S. and China? Is it is it because of the neglect of the Trump administration or uh, is it, why has it gotten so bad when, again, you would see, you would think that on so many of these issues and, uh, you know, there's there's not just shared values, but shared interests as we keep preaching to them. Well, I, I get to ask this question a lot. And my answer is something like this, that Americans always go to the Japanese and the Koreans and they say, look, and the old President Obama did this, too. We have the trilateral meeting of uh, and the sidelines of the nuclear security summit, I believe, in, in the Hague or, or in his administration, you know, let's get together. Let's focus on the shared problem of North Korea. Uh, let's look to the future. Let's not be mired in the past as uh, Americans like to say these things. And I always say, well, yeah, Americans are really good at <laughs> getting, <laughs> forgetting the past. We're still fighting the civil war. We're still dealing with the consequences of the Vietnam War. History matters. And it matters not only because uh, there are issues of unresolved issues of historical justice and so on, but because how we look at and understand the past shapes our identity as nations, as individuals and nations. Uh, we see that in American life all the time. And so you can't really say to Koreans and Japanese, well, just put the past behind you and move on. No, they, they, they have to confront these issues because it's about who they are as, as people. And the American role 
has to be to some degree, to the extent to which we can play a role, sometimes to be a kind of good offices provider uh, where people can get together and deal with these things. And maybe sometimes we can help facilitate the even the negotiation of dip, difficult diplomatic issues, but we can't substitute for the will and the desire of uh, the, the peoples and the governments themselves to want to solve these issues. As for the last three years, you know, I don't, I, I, I sort of apportion blame uh, equally in some sense. I think part of the problem is that the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement, which was a difficult agreement to reach it involved, I think, very hard issues of compromise on both sides. Um, and, and the domestic politics of it in Korea were much more complicated than in Japan. Um, it, it was a breakthrough, nonetheless. And Japanese, uh, I, I spoke to, were very wary of having that agreement be revised by a subsequent government. And initially when the Moon Jae-in government came in, President Moon, and we know the, the Democratic Party, the Min Yunang, never supported that agreement. But President Moon said, well, okay, even though we didn't support it, we accept its ongoing legitimacy. But then they changed their policy mm -hmm. for reasons you know, probably mostly driven by domestic politics, but also on questions of principle. Once that happened, it just created a really difficult situation. In I think it started the ball rolling, but then we had the court cases of the compensation for forced laborers, which, you know, those are, those are serious uh, uh, issues that the courts were trying to deal with. But Japanese, you know, in a, I think a rather narrow way, sort of said, well, you know, we've taken care of these problems. We don't want to discuss them anymore. That approach was not helpful. And we just had this downward spiral, which was fueled by, I think, really bad decisions on both sides, the Japanese decision to impose export controls on Korea, which was patently a use of export controls for other purposes. Uh, but then the Japanese just denied that that was the case in a way that I thought you know, was I mean, a huge tactical error on their part. We had the fire control radar incident, which was very dangerous and also took the security relationship where there had been some progress in cooperation, particularly trilateral cooperation, and put it in jeopardy. Uh, and the neither side was able to resolve that problem, uh, which was, a, I think, a scary thing for American you know, force commanders in both Korea and Japan, because, you know, if they're, if they're two allies are potentially firing upon each other, my God, it changes the reality. So that they have to operate in. So all those things have sort of accumulated momentum. Uh, and the big, the, the sort of total result of it is there's just massive deficit of trust mm -hmm. uh, between the two governments. And you can hear it in both places. Uh, they simply don't believe the other side. And uh, I think in Tokyo, what you hear is, well, it's hopeless. We can't deal with the uh, progressives in power in Korea. We just wait for the conservatives to come back to power. Maybe we can do something then. Or even worse, we just write off Korea. They become a, a, a lapdog of the Chinese. Uh, and certainly in Korea, there's that deep feeling that the, not only the lack of respect on the part of the Japanese, but the lack of willingness to deal with the past. So we, we've created a, a really, uh, we've, they, they've dug a deep, deep hole. And how you get out of it is not easy. Right. So they've dug this deep hit, hole, but have they hit bottom or have they stopped digging? And I guess, it's, uh, what's your sense now, and we're still in the early days of this, of what this very, you know, much more energetic and explicit uh, approach by the Biden administration to say, this really matters. Mm -hmm. We're going to put it in our joint statement. So, I mean, it was more forward leaning, I think, in the Biden moon statement than the Biden Suga statement and saying why this was important. Uh, we've got all this talk that's, that's out there now, certainly here in Washington, that, you know, something may happen at the G7 where the three can get together. 
So, I mean, you, you, you mentioned both the, the fact that the U.S. can play this kind of mediating role, and also I think you, you suggested that, that sometimes uh, you, know, you, can, you can violate the Hippocratic Oath, which applies to diplomacy and statecraft, too, of, of you can do some harm. But uh, so far, do you think this, is, this has helped to, to get them to stop digging? And do you, see, do you see a way to start digging out? And if so, I guess this goes to the policy prescriptions, which, of course, we always get to in these conversations of, of what should the Biden administration be doing? Are there actual, I know I'm asking a whole string of questions, but, right. but you know, are there, are there are some policy areas where there are such serious differences they can't work together? And then on the other hand, are there somewhere, I mean, you know, they, there, there's some room for, you know, we always mention climate change, you know, environmental issues, different things that that where they can work together. But uh, what what do you think is the right approach going forward? Well, I think the Biden administration's approach is an echo of what we saw in the Obama administration, um, which is, you know, let's in some ways it reflects what uh, Japanese and Koreans say themselves about you know a dual track approach. Let's put history issues over here and deal with other things over there. So let's move forward in the areas where we have shared interests. You mentioned a number of them, and clearly North Korea policy is, is a crucial part of that. Um, and let's put the other stuff to the side and hope that by making progress in those areas, you create a different atmosphere uh, for, for dealing with the problems of history. It, it's not that it's a wrong approach. I don't, I, I, if I were there, I'd probably try and do the same thing. And President Biden had the experience as vice president of dealing with these issues. So he's aware of them. He understands uh, the importance of it. And that's a contrast from the previous administration. I mean, there's no evidence that Donald Trump understood these issues at all or cared about them. And people in both those governments heard that. I mean, they, even if someone came to them at a lower level and said, boy, you guys really have to solve this problem, they didn't have to listen because there wasn't any messaging from the top. So big change, messaging from the top that says, this is important, we, you need to solve these problems. That's a step forward for sure. Um, I, my criticism, if I have one, is that I don't really buy the two track approach. Uh, the problem is that history issues just poison the well and you can't really separate them from the other issues. And I think that, was what the Biden, the Obama administration concluded as well, because they tried the separation approach, President Obama tried it, and it failed. And that led to the uh, efforts to facilitate the Comfort Women Agreement in 2015, which should have been the basis for moving forward. I do think that even the case of the 2015 agreement, the impetus for that, though, came from the Korean and Japanese governments. I mean, the two foreign ministries negotiated really hard. Uh, the American role really was just at certain points behind the scenes mainly to facilitate the process uh, where things got jammed up. But I do think that there has to be that impetus from within and it, that, that doesn't exist. So if it right now, I do think that the Korean government did some very important signaling earlier this year, President Moon's uh, statements after the new year about in which he said that the 2015 agreement was still an official government agreement. Um, his criticism of the uh, court decision on the Comfort Women Court decision um, was important. And of course, we had a subsequent court decision there. And then we have now this new district court decision on the forced laborers that creates an opening. Um, I'd say, unfortunately, the Japanese government has really been uh, just taken a very, I think, unproductively tough stance in response to this. Now, to some degree, it's a cynical calculation on their part that we, they don't trust President Moon, perhaps. They're waiting for you know, the elections in Korea, and they think the Americans really basically, uh, they're so they're so focused on Japan playing a central role in this grand anti-China strategy that they, they don't need to think that much or respond that much to pressure from uh, the administration. Um, maybe all those calculations are there, but I think it's also the case that, of course, we, we talked about domestic politics, uh, Prime Minister Suga and the ruling uh, coalition of, of the Liberal Democratic Party and the Kuomintang Party 
are facing a very important election in the fall. Of course, Korea has a presidential election to come. So that that narrows the bandwidth, if you will, the for for you know taking political risks for making compromise um, in, in both cases. And we haven't really tested how far President Moon is willing to go to push this. So uh, all those things make it, you know, I think what I keep hearing from friends in both Korea and Japan who want to see movement on this issue is we may just have to wait till next year. Mm -hmm. I, I worry about that because the more longer you go with a failure to be able to, to confront these issues in a productive way, the harder it gets to deal with them down the road. Yeah, I, yeah I, I worry about that too. And, and I, I think it's also in the context of, you know, maybe I have a little bit of rose colored uh, lenses when I'm looking to the past, it's sometimes the case, but you know, you and I have both been living in Korea or, or Japan, going back and forth over the decades. And even at times of considerable political tension and, and, and standoffs between the two capitals, there tended to be kind of interest groups, if you like, or stakeholders in both countries that quietly understood that, that this was an important relationship, you know, whether on the security side, the economic side, even the people to people side. And my impression now, and this is after a year or so of not being in the region, is that a lot of that has, has kind of withered a bit. And I don't know if it's withered, you know, permanently or, and that relates to the domestic politics. You know, is there, is there something for, you know, either leader, whether it's Suga and Moon now or their successors to say, we're, we're going to help fix this relationship and not just because the president, uh, because the United States wants it, because it's important to our own, uh, you know, our own goals vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis the region and our own, our own domestic economy and health. Well, there is activity. I know that because people t tell me about it, uh, but it, it's at a pretty quiet level. Um, uh, and uh, particularly, you know, Koreans who have uh, been, you know, Japan hands and managers of that relationship and their counterparts in, in Japan, they are talking to each other. I think there are even efforts to find some uh, solutions to the, particularly the issues of historical justice. Um, some of which I think are quite viable. So it's not like there isn't and aren't ideas to solve these problems. They do exist. It's, it's a political will problem. I think that um, in, in the, it, it, I see that in Korea, the Japan relations issue has become mixed up uh, in the polarized politics uh, of Korea. So the conservatives have kind of adopted this uh, stance that uh, the Moon administration has mishandled the relationship with Japan. Uh, and I noticed in the response to the latest court decision by the district court on forced labor is that the, the, the Korean media split in very mm -hmm. clear ways with the conservative media uh, saying, okay, this is an opportunity to move ahead and supporting the decision and the progressive media opposing it. I think you see similar thing in Japan uh, the Korea issue has become really uh, central to particularly, I'd call them conservative nationalists in the Liberal Democratic Party, not the entire LDP, but certainly a good chunk of it. So opposition to any kind of compromise with Korea is very strong. Uh, their, but their support for it on the, amongst liberals in Japan, absolutely. If you read the editorial pages of the Asahi Jimbun, you'll see that. Um, but you know, Suga is very weak in some ways within his own party. He's a, he doesn't have a big political base of his own. He's dependent upon uh, the folks on the right. Uh, and former Prime Minister Abe is a voice there uh, and, and others. So his room, his, you know, that doesn't mean he couldn't act. He could, but uh, he doesn't have, a, there's not a lot of impetus within his own party for that. And he's facing potentially serious challenges to his own leadership coming this fall. So all those things make it make it very tricky. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna to turn to a couple of questions. I've already alluded to them, but a couple of questions that have come in. One is from Terence Mazio, who actually had, had asked the, the question I, I, I posed earlier about kind of uh, non-governmental groups and their role. But uh, Terence also asked that in both the context of the bilateral US ROK and US Japan alliances, um, there's been discussion of widening the aperture for cooperation to include areas beyond the territories of Seoul and Tokyo. Uh, 
So, and, and then he brings up uh, the Taiwan Straits, which uh, were mentioned in both things. Is it possible uh, to bring the same approach to trilateral cooperation on issues like stability in the Taiwan Straits? Wow, that would be like a, the challenge of all time. I mean, the, there is a clear difference for me between the Korean and the Japanese response to this pressure from the Biden administration to see these things in a broader regional, even, you know, Indo-Pacific framework. The Japanese are eager to embrace that. In fact, they claim ownership of that whole idea, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, they, they see that as, uh, you know, first of all, it, it cements the importance of Japan to the United States. That's important to them because everybody's worried about American retreat. That's the kind of subtext. So how do we keep the Americans engaged and involved? So Japanese are happy to engage that broader idea, although the Japanese public, I might point out, is a little wary of being drawn into conflicts beyond their borders. So there is a lot of talk about Taiwan, particularly amongst, you know, in the right wing of the LDP. Uh, let's have our own Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, we saw the vaccine diplomacy that Japan has embarked on with Taiwan. So there's a lot of pro-Taiwani sentiment, anybody that was already there. Koreans, I think, are much more cautious about this whole broadening uh, the uh, security alliance into a larger regional framework. That's not new, as you know. Uh, we tried that during the Iraq war. Uh, I remember Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld was very irritated by the fact that we couldn't rotate American troops based in Korea out of, out of Korea into the Middle East, which we did in the case of Japan. Koreans don't want to frame the security alliance in that, in that way. I think they've responded a little bit to the pressure from the Biden administration and the reference of Taiwan and the joint statement between Moon and, and Biden was unprecedented. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure what it means in, in practice, but it was pretty significant that uh, it, Taiwan Straits made its way into a Korea uh, US statement. Uh, but still, and we've seen, of course, the debate about the Quad, join the Quad, not join the Quad, uh, which uh, Japanese, of course, are not that eager to have Korea join the Quad. So not, huh? okay. <laughs> kind of an, an amusing conversation. But um, I think that tension is there, that difference is there. It's also a difference over North Korea because mm -hmm. the clearly the Moon administration wants to engage uh, as much as they can with North Korea, revive diplomacy, maybe move back towards some kind of nuclear negotiations. And I think the Japanese still remain very, very uh, cautious, if not hostile to uh, going down that path. We saw Prime Minister Suga make references to CDID, a term I hadn't seen for a while during his visit to Washington. So those tensions are there. So you can't really use trilateral cooperation mm -hmm. in some sense to overcome that because if anything, it reveals that there are some differences there and they're not insignificant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and Mark Chokla kind of poses a question, but I mean, it's almost a comment, I think, on, on, on what you're saying as well is, is you know, that certainly the perception is that Japan's going to take this position if it's tough towards China, right? And South Korea uh, will seek to balance the relationship between the United States and China, although, as you say, editorial comment, certainly in South Korea, you know, shows that that tension. But um, but that perception in Washington, I think, is going to, I imagine, it will, will, will continue to complicate the trilateral relationship, as well as this question of where does South Korea fit into this notion of a you know, broader uh, regional engagement by and continued engagement by the United States uh, throughout throughout you know, the Pacific. I make one point, which is that the perception of Japan as being eager to you know join in some kind of you know military operations in the Taiwan Straits. I've seen that kind of thing out of commentators in the U.S., uh, particularly some people from the former Trump administration, I think is completely wrong. It's overdrawn, although it's fed by people in Japan who are advocates of that. It doesn't reflect, uh, I think, Japanese public opinion or even the political situation in Japan. The Japanese are also very nervous about the being pushed into a confrontation with China. Their economic engagement with China is no less significant than South Korea's is. And uh, while there is a lot of you know, apprehension and fear of China and Japan, there's also a long history here. And uh, if we push the Japanese to make a choice, it may not end up in the place uh, some people think it will. 
Um, yeah, it gets back to a lot of different kinds of history. And I think we all, we all need to know more of it rather than to say move past it. Uh, uh, to, I have uh, one last question for our audience, then I might turn back to North Korea for just one more thought before we try to wrap it up. We've, you've, you've covered the waterfront very well here. Um, Mark Mannion, uh, and this is something I, he says for both of us, but I'm going <laughs> to kick it to you, Dan, because I'm not sure. He asked, does the relatively recent indictment of Yoon Mi Hyung, a former president of the largest support group for comfort women on corruption charges, if you recall that, does that suggest that the taboo on criticizing comfort women support organizations in South Korea has been broken? Uh, well, I, I, from what I can read in the in South Korean media and what I hear, I think that is the case. And it, it reveals that it goes back, for instance, to the 2015 agreement, because the, the idea that the uh, Korean Council of Women uh, were excluded from the uh, discussions that led to that agreement and, uh, and their opposition to it is cited by the Moon administration as the basis for being opposed to this agreement. Uh, I think that's a, uh, those are questionable propositions because, in fact, I, I know that they were, in fact, consulted all during the process, but not, they, they didn't get their agreement before the final agreement was made. Uh, but part of that had to do with the issues of the leadership of the uh, Korean Council. And I think that's the case that, that Mark is referring to, mm -hmm. uh, sort of brings out the tensions, and we've seen it also in the criticism that was made by one of the more prominent uh, former uh, mm -hmm. women who, who criticized the way the, uh, uh, the uh, organization has been managed and led. So there are, they, those tensions have surfaced, if you will, mm -hmm. and the sort of political nature of, the, of this uh, has emerged. It doesn't necessarily make it easier to solve these problems, mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it does open the door to, uh, you know, maybe uh, trying to, to get some consensus. I mean, I, the people who I know in Korea who work really hard on implementing the 2015 agreement always point out to me that two thirds of the women who were alive at that time uh, accepted the agreement, accepted the compensation payments and the statements from the Japanese government, uh, the, the so, you know, the majority of women actually saw this as a way of gaining uh, recognition and justice. And I hope that we can return to, if not return to the 2015 agreement, uh, which is still possible, maybe the other idea, which uh, the former speaker of the Korean National Assembly, Mr. Moon, suggested of creating a new overarching uh, structure uh, fund that could deal with both the comfort women and the forced laborers together in the model of the German uh, fund for the future. So there are ideas out there like that. And I think that anything that sort of opens the conversation in that sense is good. And we need to see Japanese embrace that as well. It can't just be a conversation within Korea. Um, and the more the Japanese try and say, well, you know, this is, we finished this, we're not going to deal with it anymore. Uh, final settlement, that's it. I think that's not a helpful response at all. And it tends to give confirmation to those people in Korea who argue that with some justification that Japanese are not entirely sincere in their, uh, in their dealings with them. Yeah, no, that's my sense too. I, I mean, that as you pointed out earlier, the absence of trust and, and decline and what maybe little trust there was has really uh, undermined, I mean, a lot of ideas that, you know, on their face would, would be a step forward. And, uh, and, and it is in this context of, right, if, if, if ever, you know, Americans or American diplomats and leaders would say, history is something to put behind you, you know, look, look, look how we've done that so well in the United States. So we have to approach that, I think, with a greater awareness and and, and sensitivity that you, it's just not possible, but you do have to find a way forward. And uh, I, hopefully we can, we can bring a little bit of, of humility and wisdom to that because it's, uh, yeah, I, I know. And I, of course I hear from more Koreans, I've spent more time in Korea, but every time, I mean, all the good work that's done is, is, is undermined when a comment comes out from a politician or a newspaper or something that suggests, you know, whatever, that it was sort of a denialism. Uh, or uh, and it just uh, it just erodes uh, what what little little trust has been built up. But I want to ask you, I, and we're running out of time here. But about back to North Korea, one thing that really struck me about the uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga's visit uh, 
was his very, and it shouldn't have surprised me, but it was striking that it was uh, very, very firm language, shall we say, on, on North Korea, uh, and in a sense, taking out a position um, more uh, to the right, if you like, of, of, I think, where the Biden administration's North Korea review was. Uh, but secondly, I haven't heard much about the abductee issue, uh, which certainly was uh, you know, front and center in the six-party talks uh, when we did try to have some real trilateral cooperation as well as six-party cooperation. So your, your thoughts, is that going to be a, make, make also trilateral cooperation more difficult or for that matter, I mean, or make, make bilateral relations worse between Japan and Korea if, if Korea sees Japan as something that's kind of, kind of pulling back the Biden administration from a more... Uh, 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 forward-leaning uh, posture. Well, I think that was the perception during the Trump administration, uh, the perception in Seoul, that the Japanese were acting as a, uh, a break on any efforts to make a breakthrough uh, with, with the North Koreans. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that was entirely wrong in the sense that, the, and this I felt I was in Tokyo for a good deal of that time, and I heard right from the beginning, going back to the sort of fire and fury period, um, that Japanese, they weren't that worried about the threat of war. Uh, they viewed it as a bluff. Uh, that's a different perception than what we heard in, in Seoul. Uh, but they were really worried that the Trump administration was going to make a deal, basically, to accept uh, by a, a deal where the North Koreans would agree to end their ICBM program and cap their nuclear weapons development, uh, but leave intact mm -hmm. shorter and medium range missiles and the existing arsenal. And that was a deal that Trump would buy and be able to present as a, uh, as a great you know, peace agreement. Japanese were very fearful of that. And I think that they, and they weren't wrong, I think, to see that Trump probably was ready to, to head down that road. And Abe spent a lot of time basically warning and talking to to Trump about that. Um, I find it, so this is sort of the problem of strategic separation, you know, that where extended deterrence no longer operates. Um, I found it very interesting that Suga repeated all of this. So it told me that they're still worried about this. Um, they didn't know how the debate within the Biden administration was gonna go. And there certainly are people in the Biden administration uh, sort of in the arms, have a more arms control framework for thinking about this who advocate some, some part of a similar type of approach. So they're worried that, you know, once you get negotiations going, that viewpoint is going to predominate. So that was part of it. I think there's also a lot of Japanese domestic politics again here. Uh, so they're speaking, as all foreign leaders do, once they go to Washington, they're speaking to the Americans, but they're also speaking to folks back home. Um, but I, I think that the uh, that's going to be a tension. It's just going to be an ongoing tension. And the, the, I'm interested to watch how the Biden administration navigates this because that's what, that's what diplomacy and alliance management is about. It's how do you deal with the fact that there are, always, there are differences. We don't all agree on all these things. And we have two allies. We want to have work together, but we have different views, different priorities. Different but is views. it still important for the Japanese government, any Japanese government, to be seen as doing something on the abductees if they oh, can? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't respond. To, uh, I mean, I, I don't. It's not that I disregard the the look, the emotional importance of this issue is hard to deny. And uh, anybody, you know, I always tell Americans: imagine if Americans had been taken off the beaches of California and taken to North Korea. I mean, it would be the same issue in the U.S. Uh, you can imagine all the, the media and the way it would play. And that, that's what goes on in Japan. It's also the case, though, that it's a somewhat, you know, it's an issue that uh, former Prime Minister Abe used to some degree to elevate his own political uh, career. Um, it, it has a kind of ritual quality about it. Um, look, the Japanese have tried to negotiate with the North Koreans multiple times, not only the Koizumi uh, trips to Pyongyang in the early part of this century, but also, right. you know, repeated meetings that have taken place in back channels. Not that the Japanese wouldn't want a deal on this. And you have to wonder sometimes why the North Koreans have not sort of taken that opportunity because it will allow them to wreak mm -hmm. some havoc, I think, in the, in the U.S.-Japan <laughs> relationship. Um, so 
there's always that possibility that they'll, you know, they'll, they'll find a way to, to, to resolve this issue. Um, but on the other hand, I think Americans tend to see this as, a, you know, something they have to, you know, acknowledge, they have to always say, you know, we brought this issue up when we met with the North Koreans, Japanese need this to be said as well, you know, as a kind of, there's a sort of ritual quality about it that I wonder sometimes whether there's anything more than that going on. Mm -hmm. All right, last question. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing that we're gonna see a photograph come out of the G7 of, of President Biden, Prime Minister Suga, President Moon all together uh, with the three flags there. Um, is it going to matter? Uh, is anything going to, are we gonna see some, any kind of progress or we're gonna to have to wait until there's a, a, a political change leadership in, in the two countries? Well, it matters in the sense of this messaging that's going on about we need you to work together, we need to find areas to work together. That messaging, uh, I mean, Biden, I think, brought it up with Suga. He brought it up with Moon. But it's very important to bring it up with everybody together. And it reminds me a little of the, as I said, President Obama made similar efforts uh, uh, on the sidelines of international meetings. So I think not only the leaders need to hear it, but the publics need to hear it, that it matters to us. Um, I would be much more impressed if, Suga and Moon met together in a bilateral, a serious bilateral meeting. That's the meeting I really want to see take place because that's the that's where the the disconnect uh, is happening. And until we see that, I'm not sure we can really have much sense of optimism about where things are headed. And so far as I know, at this point, that's not going to take place. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we have uh, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I I again. You know, both of these are men facing elections, facing, a, you know, a, a, you know, the old uh, Tip O'Neill statement about all, all politics are local. Uh, and, and that's true when it comes to foreign policy as well. Yeah. Foreign policy is local and you can't separate the domestic politics from foreign policy. We, we certainly don't do it. I don't know nope. why we would expect anybody else to. <laughs> More true than ever. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Dan. Thank you very much. I look forward to your column, perhaps, on the trilateral meeting that might take place or, or whatever other developments take place. But thank you for, uh, for joining us. Thanks for your continuing thoughts and, and contributions. I hope to see you either in Palo Alto or Washington or maybe, who knows, somewhere in Asia before too long. Well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and to do this with uh, uh, KEI, whose work I really admire and depend on myself. So. Uh, uh, it's great to do this. And yes, I, I'm looking forward to being liberated to move around in the world uh, and beyond, <laughs> beyond Palo Alto. And I definitely, uh, Korea and Japan are at the top of my list of places I need to get back to and understand what's going on. So again, thank you very Perfect. much. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us.